Okay, we're going to make a start, everyone. Thanks for coming along to this uh, session this afternoon on uh, narratives, vested interests, and opposition strategies around fossil fuel production. Uh, my name is Peter Newell from University of Sussex, and I have the honour of uh, moderating this session this afternoon. Um, we have four speakers. They've each promised, hand on heart, that they're going to stick to 10 minutes, so hopefully I won't need to intervene to remind them uh, to, to stick to time. Um, we'll just take them in the order that we have here in the programme. So first of all, we've got uh, Clemens Kalper from the Free University in Amsterdam. He's going to talk about fossil fuel advertising under consumer law. Clemens, you have the floor. Thanks so much for uh, allowing me to present. I'm talking about a topic of challenging fossil advertising under consumer law. I want to touch uh, briefly on uh, three areas. First, uh, the problem with fossil advertising in the climate crisis. Now that's uh, maybe not that challenged here, so uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about fossil advertising as a supply side issue. Then um, fossil advertising bans as an instrument of fossil fuel control. And the third part about one strategy, which is uh, mobilizing consumer law against uh, fossil advertising. Now, first issue problem with fossil advertising in the climate crisis. Obviously, one problem is that it normalizes uh, a harmful commodity and presents the continued use of it as normal and acceptable, even if it's not. Uh, this one is a campaign by Shell where they plastered their logo all across uh, Amsterdam public transport systems, like the Amsterdam uh, ferries, which is uh, what triggered my interest uh, years ago. Um, what fossil advertising also does is it uh, misleads uh, the public about the impact of fossil fuels and about their producers. This one is uh, uh, BP reimagining itself as a net zero. Um, it, fossil advertising uh, subverts or can support uh, subvert the public understanding of uh, the need to cut emissions and uh, also about the necessary uh, consumption changes, for example, by promoting unrealistic techno fixes. So you can see here, this is uh, an ongoing uh, shale campaign, drive CO2 neutral through apparently uh, the forests. Uh, last uh, uh, thing that fossil advertising does, it, it influences policymakers and media. Uh, this graphic shows how uh, fossil advertising on Facebook reacted in 2020 presidential elections in the US, reacted to the Biden announcement of the climate plan. So you can see how there is a direct relationship of fossil advertising. Um, maybe um, more generally speaking, um, one could say that uh, fossil advertising is not so much about creating a additional demand, which is typically how advertising is conceptualized, but uh, research sh shows that uh, fossil advertising is often uh, more about um, yeah, creating or maintaining the, uh, the, um, the social license, license to operate for fossil operate for fossil fuel producers. So in that sense, you could say it's more a supply side measure because it uh, is aimed at extending the market uh, continuing uh, the possibility of marketing uh, fossil products in the future. Now, a uh, second point, uh, advertising bans as a uh, instrument of fossil fuel control. The model that we could look at, of course, is the uh, World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Advertising, which is a successful international agreement about a harmful commodity. And interesting about this framework convention is that it uh, takes an integrated approach targeting both uh, the demand side and the supply side. So the, it's argued that uh, both are necessary. Uh, it contains a uh, comprehensive ban on all tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorship. Maybe also interesting about the uh, tobacco convention is how explicit it is about the harm of tobacco producers. So it states very clearly, uh, essentially, uh, that uh, tobacco uh, producers should be kept away from public education measures about tobacco, about public health measures about tobacco, about policy making about tobacco, which is, of course, very different to what uh, we have been seeing about yeah, how, like, uh, let's say, uh, public policy deals with the role of uh, uh, fossil companies. Maybe also one interesting issue to mention uh, at the Framework Convention of Tobacco Control is the concept of brand stretching. Brand stretching describes 
the use of a tobacco brand for non-tobacco products. So uh, Marlboro Light on, I don't know, a car or whatever. Also prohibited according to the framework convention or should be prohibited according to the framework convention. That's interesting from a fossil perspective because what we see now in advertising by fossil companies is that fossil companies mainly uh, show their uh, show um, advertising about renewable energy, actually, even though their investment in terms of capital investment is still quite low. Yeah, so this is an example of uh, yeah, BP's uh, Twitter feed um, promoting uh, their solar investment. Um, there is an ongoing European citizen initiative about the European aiming for a European legislative ban on fossil advertising by Greenpeace. That was their uh, opening action last year in Rotterdam. This is, uh, I looked at the numbers, this is likely not going to succeed. Um, so the one million necessary signatures will not uh, 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 be managed. Uh, but there is uh, uh, various local initiatives, uh, for example, the city of Amsterdam has been uh, banning advertising for fossil fuels and high fossil or high carbon uh, products. Which leads me now to um, an alternative strategy of uh, targeting uh, fossil advertising, if not like if the legislative mean creating like a legislative ban uh, is not yet successful, is to mobilize consumer law against fossil advertising. Consumer law, or one part of consumer law, prohibits uh, co deceptive commercial practices, and that would inclu include uh, advertising that is either factually incorrect or otherwise uh, deceptive. There is, uh, in virtually all jurisdictions, there is hard law bans, hard law meaning that it's enforceable by courts or regulatory authorities. In the EU, it would be the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive implemented into all national laws. In the US, one example that I pulled out would be the New York City Consumer Protection Law. There's also various uh, soft law instruments that can be mobilized. Uh, for example, the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises or industry self-regulation. In the UK, it would be the ASA, Advertising Standards Authority. In the uh, Netherlands, which is uh, my uh, accidental area of expertise, the Reklame Code Commission. Now, what type of uh, cases against fossil advertising can we identify? There is uh, first a type of case that is now big in the US, which is uh, targeting the systematic deception of the public by fossil fuel companies. So there is now a number of big cases going on, uh, uh, launched by US states or cities. Uh, against fossil companies, for example, the New York City um, Earth Day lawsuit, uh, which uh, targeted Shell, Exxon, and uh, BP, and the American Petroleum Institute for having systematically and intentionally misled consumers in New York City about the central role their products play in causing the climate crisis. This, of course, is uh, uh, in some ways modeled on tobacco lit uh, litigation uh, some decades earlier. This is a second type of uh, uh, complaints that we can see, complaints or lawsuits that we can see, challenging unrealistic techno fixes. This one is the Dutch version of the uh, Drive CO2 neutral campaign by Shell. You can see a, a tanker full of gasoline saying, uh, I'm driving CO2 neutral uh, to the driver in the back, U2, um, shaming the driver with, the, with this image of the fire and the dead fish and the dead, and the dead tree. Um, this one we challenged successfully in the Netherlands for misleading consumers because the climate benefits of offsetting is not equivalent to the climate harm of uh, emissions, which would be the, be the translating into law the fact, like the scientific critiques about forest-based offsetting. Yeah. Another example would be a, a lawsuit in Australia against Santos, a fossil fuel companies, about using uh, carbon capture and storage in their uh, emission strategy. Uh, so saying that's like not a viable technology. A third type of lawsuits uh, that uh, can be seen is uh, these ones. Uh, you would use consumer law to scrutinize corporate mitigation plans. Uh, this is an advertising by Total. Um, their new climate ambition is to get to net zero by 2050. That was challenged under consumer law in France by NGOs earlier this year. And the argument was that um, this is like a market, like this is something that would uh, be called like an ambition, which is usually not 
like an advertising authority is not going to say that this is uh, like illegal because how do you prove that an ambition is like incorrect but if you look into the investment uh, strategy of the company you see that Total is actually planning to expand uh, for example ex uh, gas exploration and that way it is factually impossible to reach uh, that target if uh, the company is actually following up on their investment strategy. Um, so that would be a third way of mobilizing consumer law, a little bit beyond just like targeting individual greenwashing cases because then you'll always be behind what the corporations are doing. But these would be three ways how you could uh, leverage consumer law in a more strategic sense. Yeah, summing up, um, fossil advertising bans, uh, they could play a relevant role in overall strategy and fossil fuel control. And uh, one thing I presented is how consumer law could be mobilized against fossil advertising. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kara Pike with Climate Access, which is a climate communications organization in the US. And we also have just started one in Canada. It's not public yet, so you're the first to know. Um, and as mentioned, I work on the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. I'm the Senior Communications Advisor, and we're hiring a comms director, if you know anybody. Um, today, what I'm going to do is cover the research and guidance that we've developed based on that research on how to frame supply side issues. We did look specifically at how to talk about a treaty, but also just a whole range of issues that get into this um, topic area. And what that uh, resulted in is six different playbooks. So we did this work in six different countries. Five were through the fossil fuel treaty. Six was through the Canadian organization, but we still tested how to talk about the treaty. Um, there were a number of different research inputs to this work. We did a roll up of existing public opinion research in each country with the exception of Kenya because we couldn't find any. Uh, we did a media analysis, how are these issues being talked about, uh, social media analysis, uh, who's talking about what and what way, and then message testing. And I want to point that for outside of the U.S. and Canada, we worked with organizations to design and run that message testing because we weren't going to assume we understood the context uh, ourselves to do that. So what I'm going to do is walk through some overall trends that we saw from the research. Uh, some a little bit about the the meta narrative. So we're aiming for like what is the overarching story, but then how does that get customized per the context? And as you probably all know, the industry is quite good at having common arguments everywhere they go, but doing that um, distinguishing for for countries. So, in terms of the overall trends, um, people support uh, renewable energy. But unfortunately, all of the countries are still quite split over whether or not we need to move away from oil and gas. And so I think this is a really important trend because we've just seen climate concern go higher and higher and higher all around the world. But we're not seeing movement on attitudes about getting off of um, the dirty stuff. Uh, concerns about rising energy costs are common in every jurisdiction. It plays out differently if it's um, global south versus global north, but nonetheless, that's still there. People are becoming increasingly afraid of extreme weather events and recognize there is a problem, but that is not being connected back to fossil fuels, uh, the climate impacts of fossil fuels, nor air pollution, which is often a bigger concern of people's when it comes to fossil fuels. The label natural creates confusion, right? Natural gas, like what is natural gas? So people don't automatically put that in the fossil category. Um, and are really unclear of its impacts, both on health and the climate. And that was true in all of the jurisdictions. And there's also low confidence that the power of the fossil fuel industry can be limited. So nobody likes it. It's like we're between a rock and a hard place, but nobody thinks we're actually going to break all of the economic and political power that they have. Some distinctions. Climate concern is actually higher in the global south than in uh, the US and Canada. However, people self-report not being as literate about climate change, not really knowing enough about it or having the information. Um, in the global south, development needs are directly tied to fossil fuels, and you see that both in public opinion but in the discourse. And then in the US and Canada, you have extreme political polarization really skewing the whole conversation. 
So um, in terms of we did look at the dominant industry narratives um, on social media and in the media, uh, and I think it was a great example of what you just presented because it tracks that very much. They claim they're part of the climate solution, position themselves as innovative and contributing to a positive future. They argue expansion must take place due to energy and economic needs, and they promote net zero pledges despite being based on unproven expensive options. So when it comes to the top level framings, um, what we really are, are seeing that is working across all of the jurisdictions is actually leading with a positive vision of what it will be like when we get off of fossil fuels. So often we start with all the problems and all the bad stuff, but it's actually much more motivating for people if we can help them imagine. Because again, we're in this rock and a hard place, so people can't see it. They don't know what this is going to be like. Um, we've got to make the links between fossil fuels, air pollution, health, and climate change, uh, and extreme weather. People care about extreme weather, air pollution, but we have to tie that back to fossil fuels. We have to highlight why the fossil fuel companies cannot be trusted and why government accountability is needed. Emphasize that actually we do not need fossil fuels to meet our development goals or our energy needs. There are enough renewable energy potential in every region of the world, and it's now the affordable, uh, safe option. And that's really important. People, again, like renewable energy, but don't necessarily think they're going to have access to it, be able to um, pay for it, or that it will be as reliable. Uh, amplify, it's not an energy transition if fossil fuel producing countries keep growing out the problem. The first step is to end expansion. So we don't need to turn off the taps immediately, but we need to stop expanding the problem. And um, we need as part of that to make sure that the big fossil fuel producing nations that are wealthy are taking responsibility. And finally, what we found is that people really like the idea, OK, maybe we're not going to turn things off overnight, but we need a plan to get off of this. We actually need a plan, and it does need to be a global plan so that everybody's in, or else nobody's going to believe it's going to happen. So what does that play out then in terms of that meta narrative I was talking about? So in terms of narrative, just for those who aren't in communications, every good story has three components. There's tension. Right? There has to be something that has to be overcome, a problem, something that you want that you can't quite get. Um, you have to have what's the choice, right? What do, can we actually do about it? What is that pathway going forward? And then what will get better when we uh, actually achieve that? And as I just mentioned, um, putting that benefit first is actually uh, a lot more appealing. And that's really about making the benefits clear and tangible through examples of how things are evolving. Uh, for example, I'm from a real small town in uh, Fort Erie in, in Ontario, Canada, which now has one of the largest solar manufacturing plants in the world, and it used to be farmland, right? So these stories of, of the transition uh, emerging, that we really, um, the costs of, of inaction are greater than taking action. Um, the challenge, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Again, it does get tailored depending on the country, but we need to make sure we're letting people know that the extreme weather events they are worried about are being driven by three products, coal, oil, and gas. Um, and that these also, these three products are also harming our environment, uh, our health, and creating problems for workers. The lack of energy access is holding people back, right? And, and we heard earlier in the, in the plenary, it's not going to be met with uh, fossil fuels. Um, to emphasize the fact that we are building out more of the problem, and I think this is where the work of the production gap report is actually super compelling. And when you can say things like this, you know, the planned production will result in two times the pollution, like make it really tangible for people. That really works too. Last week, the Global Registry of Fossil Fuels was just released. So another sort of real tangible data point we have is that there's seven times uh, the, well, the reserves that we have in the world, if we were to develop them, would result in seven times more uh, pollution than what our budget allows. So people need those, like, you know, things that they can grab onto. Um, making sure we're pivoting to who re is responsible for the problem. It's the fossil fuel uh, companies who are behind this. 
And that is why we do need the, um, the, the government action. The pathway, this is about now, right? This isn't about five years from now. This is the crossroads moment we're at. And we also know that from the data that was presented this morning from IEA, um, but really emphasizing that in our stories. Um, the pathway forward, making it really clear. People don't know what it means to actually make this transition. We're all trying to figure it out too, but to kind of de-wonk it and what are some of the steps we can start taking now? Uh, we need that plan to phase out fossil fuels and fast track clean energy and other low carbon solutions. That's all language that tested well in every country. So the idea of phasing out, phasing um, down, and scaling up, ramping up the good stuff. I hope none of you ever say manage decline. It doesn't work. It sounds like you're managing the end of your life, and that's not a fun thing that most people like to think about. Um, the fossil fuel nonproliferation treaty tested very well as a vehicle that this could actually foster the international cooperation and the idea that you'd have to get people all in, right, and working together. Okay, so I just want to um, show a little bit, I'm not going to talk through this, but in terms of how this plays out. So again, that meta narrative, there are commonalities. I want to just say, though, there are differences. So for example, in the US, you can lean into things like, um, you know, the US's place in the world economically, being a leader, being innovative. Um, when it comes to India, uh, you're talking a lot more about air pollution, the issues from coal, right? So you have to, again, make it distinct for, for the context, but nonetheless, um, there are commonalities there. And then I just want to leave you with a few tips that also emerged from all of this work. Um, it's really important to reference examples of when the world came together in the past to take on great challenges, because we can forget that. But when you reference ideas like what we did on uh, landmines, banning those, dealing with the ozone, holding the ozone later, dealing with asbestos, then people really get a sense of, wow, actually maybe we could do this. We've done it before, we could do it again. Elevating those stories of local resistance into a larger global call to action. That the movement to, get a, to phase down fossil fuels and expand the good stuff is gaining momentum. It is now the inevitable. Don't say natural when talking about gas. Never put that word in front of it. Uh, and this, you know, is a bit um, context specific, but we do know things like in the States, if you say methane gas, because people have a sense that's dirty. Um, there's been campaigns in Canada just saying unnatural gas, <laughs> which really, I actually love that kind of twists with the way the industry does it. Avoid using things like big oil. Or, you know, the, don't give them more power by talking about how huge and powerful they are. It's about focusing on this is a dying industry whose time has come. Bye-bye. See you later. Take your mess with you. Um, and then finally, uh, we do need to talk about the economics and beyond the affordability uh, and reliability of clean energy. Where are people's lives and livelihoods going to be in this transition? And the numbers are great, right? You need those, but those alone don't work. And if you see the industry doesn't do it that way either, they don't just make, make a straight up, oh, there's now X number of jobs in this industry. Instead, they tell stories of who are the people in these jobs? What are their lives like? How have they gotten better? How are they achieving what they want? So the industry does that really well on the fossil fuel side. We need to start elevating, like who has the jobs? Uh, how did they get there? What are their lives like now? as a result. But there also are some really great numbers out there. For example, California is an oil producing state. There's now six times more jobs in clean energy than in, in, the, in the yucky stuff. So uh, we have all of those playbooks uh, about to be released. Uh, feel free to give me your card and I'm happy to send them all to you. But thank you very much. Thanks very much, Cara. So uh, next up, we have Chris from Culture Unstained in the UK. He's going to be talking about taking the logos down from oil sponsorship, not big oil sponsorship, but oil sponsorship, uh, to fossil-free culture. Chris. For those of you that haven't heard of Culture Unstained before, we're a kind of research and campaigns organisation, but we sort of 
Um, it's that thing of crediting all of the other people involved in a, a movement and a campaign, which we're part of this much bigger fossil free culture movement that do the work around cultural sponsorship. Um, and I imagine most of us have sort of encountered or are aware of the strategy of using cultural sponsorship previously by the tobacco industry in order to kind of manage its brand and maintain that social license to operate that industry term. Um, and that's been a really core cool part of the fossil fuel industry's playbook for a long time. These are primarily UK uh, kind of based examples of that as well. Um, some of the kind of key things just to, to highlight about it is the use of naming rights. So the, the way of kind of substituting the names of the companies, the corporations, so we have the BP Portrait Award. It is embodying the artwork and cultural activity. Um, the Wonder Lab at the Science Museum in London isn't just the Wonder Lab, it's the Equinor Gallery. So it's, and it, again, in the top right for the Paralympic Games, you see this kind of recreation of the BP brand. So that's really embedded in the Paralympic Games branding. I guess what I want to kind of dig into a little bit around the, the cultural sponsorship piece is I think as we've been hearing already, it, it taps into the, the kind of social license question. So on the face of it, it looks like a kind of cheaper form of advertising. The amount of money that goes to these cultural institutions is proportionally very small compared to the budgets of, of the companies. Um, but of kind of some of the work we do is digging into what are the ways that uh, these companies are really creating obstacles by embedding themselves in state institutions, cultural institutions. And I guess it it's a similar model to how uh, we might look at the relationships between universities including the one we're in, um, and many others, um, and we see a similar kind of pattern playing out with cultural institutions. Um, this was a slide from BP's sort of PR planning ahead of relaunching with that net zero ambitions, um, and primarily Bernard Looney launching an Instagram profile, which I'm sure we've all spent a lot of time looking at or I have. Um, but as you see in the bottom corner, sponsorship, whether that's cultural institutions or sports sponsorship, et cetera, et cetera, is still a core piece of that, that kind of uh, that advocacy piece. And as it's becoming more and more apparent, young people and influencers are, are kind of on the agenda there. But like I say, it's very um, calculated. Um, so years ago at the BP AGM, someone uh, put a question to the board about investment in cultural sponsorship and they said the same kind of considerations BP would make about uh, production or investment in new wells they they applied the same kind of thinking to cultural sponsorship in terms of is it making a return for us this comes from a much larger piece of mapping and analysis we did several years ago so it's um, obviously things have advanced beyond here but what we discovered is that the specific targeting of cultural sponsorship within a UK context and then also within cultural institutions in Russia, there was a kind of mirroring. And what BP was latching itself onto at the same time as being involved in the kind of lobbying of government ministers and so on was the cultural diplomacy pieces. So the loaning of objects from Russia to the British Museum in London, uh, the tour of the Marinsky Orchestra uh, to the Royal Opera House in London. So these pieces were the kind of formalities of government meetings and political process uh, are kind of put to one side and champagne glasses and canapes are the basis for the interaction. Um, a kind of just a, an illustrative example of this is this is Valery Gergiev, the conductor, um, and at that time of, of the Marinsky Theatre. And this was a BP promotional film. This screenshot comes from where he says, we share the same approach to the changing world around us. So really those, the lines, the language, the talking points have been embedded in the cultural activity. And he's become an ambassador for BP at the same time as being a very close ally of Vladimir Putin. This gives you a flavour, again, of that going even deeper. So some of the investigations work we've done more recently, that even just our kind of culture institutions protecting and upholding uh, the, the positions of the company, so the Science Museum in London, as a, as a matter of practice in the contracts, will have effectively a gagging clause, a, a non-disparagement clause in these contracts. So for the Science Museum, which is now putting on new exhibitions around energy and climate, it's not in a position to offer any kind of bold critique of the activity of BP, Shell, Equinor and Adani, because all four of them are its corporate partners. 
Um, at the British Museum, it's a slightly different situation. Uh, BP is their sponsor, but they have this, um, this group, the Chairman's Advisory Group, which has various corporate representatives, including BP, but they don't believe they need to disclose the minutes or the membership of that organization. So these are the kind of bodies where these relationships are shored up, and that's, that's why we see a real kind of importance in challenging and exposing them. This becomes all the more problematic when these kind of relationships are contested, and then the response uh, from the companies is to ask all of the security teams from the respective cultural institutions to come over for a meeting in their head office in London and collaborate. Um, and in the UK context, again, these culture institutions are state funded. Uh, we refer to them as arm's length government bodies. So there's meant to be a level of independence and neutrality, but here they are using their security teams in order to uphold uh, the BP narrative. And this, um, this was actually from a meeting with our Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and we were talking about production, the North Sea, and then at the end, they really wanted to talk about the opposition to our sponsorship, because that's how important this territory is to BP. Um, so again, that, that question of going beyond the kind of, uh, I guess, the symbolic way we might think about it, the, the management of the brand, to actually, these are the kind of integral relationships that they want to shore up and hold on to. And the way we've arrived at that point is this kind of domino effect of these relationships ending. And in, in terms of telling that positive story, I think the cultural sponsorship campaigns we've seen across several countries have been an opportunity to show that domino effect and really kind of push these institutions people have emotional or personal connections to and relationships to and seeing them shift. Uh, so all of the Shell sponsored cultural institutions on the South Bank in London have now ended partnerships with Shell. But at the same time, we saw the same thing happening in the centre of Amsterdam on their museum, Plein, the Van Gogh, the, um, and the Concertgebouw there. Um, and earlier this year, the National Portrait Gallery in London uh, ended its relationship with BP after 30 years. And, and part of the significance of this is that 30 years is also the same amount of time that BP has been operating in Russia. So again, that cultural space was the basis for those kind of conversations and interactions. And Again, I think there's, I'm, so my background is originally sort of from studying music and art and so on. And I think there's real power in terms of these questions about narratives and opposition strategies to the techniques used by the activists. And, and some of this I've been involved in myself, but this is Liberate Tate. And you might have seen some of these iconic images uh, in Tate Modern and Tate Britain. Uh, this is Liberon Le Louvre in Paris. This is Fossil Free Culture NL in the Van Gogh Museum. Um, and this is BP or not BP uh, in London. And again, using the cultural spaces as public spaces to contest these narratives, and also occasionally bring a large BP branded Trojan horse to the front gates of the museum. But really effective ways of interrogating and disrupting the narrative. And I, I think sometimes when we think about the role of art in how we mediate our language and our thinking around climate issues, it's sort of seen as having a passive role. The thinking happens here, we mediate it through art. Whereas here, I think the art making is very complex, sophisticated, organized, and it's playing quite an active role. Um, but I think the real strength, and maybe thinking about some of the issues that came up in an earlier session, is the intersection. Um, and so when the British Museum hosted uh, this exhibition on Indigenous Australia a few years ago, there were a whole series of objects which are the subject of restitution claims. So rather than seeing these issues as separate from one another, BP or not BP, mounted protests and worked with Rodney Kelly, who is uh, calling for the Gwigal Shield and the museum's collection to be returned, and started joining the dots and looking at uh, the kind of histories of colonialism that were embedded in the British Museum and the ways in which they're embedded in the kind of processes of fossil fuel extraction today, and really trying to shift and address the ways that we think about and frame uh, our kind of campaigns uh, against the fossil fuel industry. And the way that's sort of moving is here, centering the voices of British Iraqi women um, around an exhibition that was displaying uh, Iraqiology. Um, and so while BP was using that to promote its operations in Iraq today, um, again, there were contested objects in archaeology in that space. And so maybe just to conclude, I appreciate it's quite a whistle-stop 
talk through some of these things, but um, I was point to this quote, uh, quotation from Raul Martinez, who was shortlisted for the BP Portrait Award, and he said, valuable creative expression is not limited to the traditional artistic formats. Every choice is inherently creative. If our cultural institutions took a principled stand on this urgent issue, it would, in and of itself, be a beautiful creative act, certainly as valuable as any painting or performance they might showcase. And I think it just demonstrates the real awareness of the how entrenched the relationships of a BP, a Shell or any other company, the government and the state and the vested interests are within these cultural spaces, but then also the power of activists and creative art makers and culture makers to disrupt that and start shifting the narrative. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks, thanks very much, Chris. And so now turning to the petrochemical industry, Jochheim's going to, from Lund University, is going to be talking about narrating decarbonisation stories of climate action in the petrochemical industry. I am, yes, thank you for that. I'm Joachim, um, presenting work done in collaboration with uh, co some uh, colleagues and also Frederick Bauer, who's, who's here in the room. And uh, now we're moving uh, downstream, I guess, or upstream, depends on how you look at it, for, but from oil and, and gas extraction to the petrochemical industry. And I want to start by showing you this picture of uh, an artwork called the, the Giant Plastic Tap. It was created by Benjamin uh, von Wong. Uh, and this is from Nairobi uh, at the uh, United Nations Environmental Assembly earlier this year, where there was made a resolution for a global treaty on plastics. And here you could say there's, it, it instigates a discussion on whether we should turn off the tap, not on, only on oil and gas, but also on plastics. And that's a really, really relevant discussion because if you look at industry projections, if you look at the projections by the IEA, BP, and their energy outlooks, um, consultancies in the chemical industry, they all expect that the main driver of oil demand growth going forward in the coming decades will be plastics and petrochemicals. So as, say, the use of fossil fuels for transport declines, then plastics will proliferate, chemical use will proliferate, and so it's expected to be a major source of uh, revenue going forward. And so this context of a potential global plastics treaty and the prospects of turning off the tap on plastics is a major threat to the industry, not surprisingly, and there's been uh, ongoing uh, lobbying and campaigning, a lot of work on trying to focus a potential or a plastics treaty towards waste management, uh, ocean cleanup, that sort of thing, and not so much about the production side. But at the same time, there has been caps uh, called, uh, uh, calls for caps to global production on plastics to combat not only the plastics but also the climate crisis. And that's where uh, the, this presentation comes in. Um, so given that, it's pretty interesting to look into the transition narratives, I think, in the petrochemical industry. And that's um, some of and the, this work um, is uh, what are the findings from this work is then you know, what I'll spend the rest of the presentation on and uh, I mean in terms of the theoretical framework we do draw a little bit on the work of, uh, of Peter Newell here but and also but also focus more on, on narratives and uh, and then we look at a bunch of different PR materials sustainability reports been attending industry conferences and the like and then overall we've you know coded that and then we combine that into main three main transition narratives and the first of that one I think is is arguably the most important one and, and arguably also the one which is very unique to plastics and petrochemicals and that is the notion of the industry as realizers of sustainability and I mean it's great that we've already been talking about narratives and we you know see the idea of some challenges and, and a pathway and, and all of that and here the problem is actually that people misconstrue or misunderstand the industry and the role of industry in fostering sustainability or realizing sustainability. It might be that chemicals are uh, emission or energy intensive, but what they do is that they enable emissions reductions. They, you know, EVs are lighter because they are made of plastics. Uh, 
um, plastics are used for wind turbines, they're needed for solar cells, they're needed for the energy transitions, plastics is the claim, increase uh, or decrease food waste, all those sorts of claims. And so you see, for example, here Linde saying that a subset of Linde applications enable more than twice the greenhouse gas benefit than was admitted in all global operations. So actually, the industry as of now is a net benefit in terms of, of climate action. And you see here, this is um, to, the, to, to the right hand side, that's uh, BSF, one of the biggest producers in, in the world, having the same uh, sentence uh, in year after year after year in their, their sustainability report saying we offer our customers solutions that help prevent greenhouse gas emissions, improve energy, uh, and resource efficiency. I can say Linde, for example, some of the products that they highlight that is solvents used to increase jet turbine efficiency. So, I mean, it's often also these products are used for what you could easily label non-sustainable activities. And what's the problem here? Well, the problem is, of course, that these, this claim is used to, to fend off criticisms leveraged against the industry and it also pretty interesting in terms of carbon accounting because claiming emission reductions from product offsets means that you know we'll have double counting if you also actually count the emission reductions at the source and so you will have a lot of companies claiming all to reduce emissions and still have a lot of emissions and we see it here for example Dow they have a net zero target across all scopes as one of the few petrochemical companies but if you read the footnotes in the sustainability reports, you will see that this target includes product uh, benefits or offsets from product benefits. So exactly what we just saw from, from Linde with a company with massive direct emissions already claim that they are a net benefit. Okay, second narrative, and this is perhaps a bit more, you know, close to the technological optimism, that sort of climate delay discourse, but it's the notion that the industry um, is uniquely suited to confront the climate crisis. They are breakthrough type technology pioneers. It's in their corporate DNA and they are innovators and have been so for a century. So who is better suited to address climate change than them? This is from an industry conference. Um, Robert Seaman saying, if chemistry, ke chemistry can't do it, nobody can. BSF saying we are pioneering carbon-free production processes. DAO, they are delivering breakthrough innovations. So, and that's the, the type of language. And so other actors, you could say, in the innovation regime or, or, or calls that are pressures leveraged against the industry, pushing innovation in a certain direction, you know, all of that, that's not really part of the important, uh, the important part of the story. The important part of the story is that the pioneers, that, that the, those are the industry actors. Okay, and then the third and, and final transition narrative that we focus on is also something that resembles, you could say, other industries, but it's the notion that the industry is already well underway and that it has, it's on this journey, often it's framed as a, as a journey towards climate neutrality, a sustainability journey, and that they are, you know, however difficult, managing this in an orderly fashion and you should, you know, trust industry that all of what they've been doing is part of this pathway towards net zero. And it's in here's top, uh, top right, right? It's really smooth, it's pretty neat. We're reaching zero, no, no worries. And often they are ahead, of, uh, ahead on target or they're doing pretty well. And I guess one of the especially worrisome uh, variations of this is when this uh, relabeling actions that have been, uh, that would have been taken so otherwise for legal, uh, reasons or for economic reasons, and then relabeling it as part of this this journey towards uh, towards net zero, and so you know, building on again a long history of uh, ecological concerns, you could say the the industry is handling things, and when you then put those three together, you end up with a say discursive strategy where the industry is doing well already, and they will be even better in the future, and also are realizing sustainability now. So they are, uh, <laughs> they are helping realize sustainability in an ever greener, ever more sustainable, sustainable way. So, and this is say uh, a, a, an effort to map the, to the value chain, so to speak, and where the narratives fit in. And when we then relate it 
to say the broader disc uh, literature on 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 discourse of climate delay we see they they uh, resonate with those although they take a particular um, form in the petrochemical industry but they resonate with notions of all talk and little action what about ism and technological optimism and what we also see is that although acknowledging sustainability issues these are often framed in terms of the force of consumer demand and individualism redirecting responsibility comparable to tobacco and uh, big oil or not so big oil small oil <laughs> and when you then take it together you, you see that the industry portrays itself as essential and indis indispensable the chemicals are the building blocks of modern life they are the building blocks of sustainability so they will be needed and so you cannot or should not question what the industry is doing you should be thankful and happy that it exists and this is the petrochemical the petrochemical europe saying that we built the future and similar to how say oil and gas corporation will then show renewables the petrochemical industry will also show renewables when when they do their pr campaigning and then just lastly why this framing there's this um, very remarkable quote i think at an industry conference made by a consultant in a, in a, in a global consultancy, um, major petrochemicals in the, uh, conference asked, by, and, at the, and, and it was on like current trends and climate plastic crisis, how to navigate that. He ended his presentation by asking the audience, the you know, representatives from the biggest petrochemical producers in Europe, can you negate or convert threats and position to capture opportunities? No, that, that was the main, the main question asked in the context of these transition pressures. So, yeah, summing up, industry actors plan for a chemical future for petroleum. Expectations are plastics will drive and petrochemicals will drive oil demand growth. And then these narratives that we've found, they frame corporate actors as transition enablers, you could say, indispensable to the transition. And I would, I would argue that the contest of the struggle over how to frame plastics, how to frame petrochemicals, is likely to be a key point of contention in the uh, upcoming Global Plastic Treaty negotiations. Thank you. So thank you to all our speakers for keeping to time and for giving us a rich set of presentations and plenty of food for thought. Uh, we've got nearly half an hour for questions and discussion. Um, so I think we'll take clusters of questions to try and keep the flow of the conversation going. When you introduce yourself, please keep your questions short and tell us who you are and, and where you're from. Uh, question there, front row, first of all, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this question's for Clements or anyone else who wants to answer it. Uh, I was just wondering if you've looked at the role of states in obstructing, uh, when you're looking at, um, sorry, addressing greenwashing, in Australia, we have all those advertisements like Shell is carbon neutral. Uh, the difference is in Australia, they're also accompanied by a little trademark that says certified carbon neutral by the Australian government. And it, yeah, we're good. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> so I guess what I'm really interested in and not to self promote, but this is what I'm talking about tomorrow is in a lot of cases, states are getting involved in industry greenwashing because it benefits them to do so. So how do you then uh, use consumer law or, or soft law or those international frameworks when greenwashing is actually being baked into regulatory regimes um, at, at, a, at a state level, at a federal level? I don't know if this is something that's being um, carried out elsewhere or else Australia is just particularly good at being bad. Um, but I'm just finding it's 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 going to be hard to tackle greenwashing by industry when government is endorsing the greenwashing. Okay, thanks very much. And then, two, yeah, in that same row, just along. Uh, Christian Downey from the Australian National University. I loved all those presentations. Thanks so much. I had two quick questions, one for Clemens and Chris. Clemens, you mentioned about all the advertising for social licence reputation issues. I was interested if you'd done any, any distinction between that money spent on reputational branding versus that that's for particular issue-based campaigns. I'd be great to hear if there's any data on that. And on the cultural sponsorships, um, Chris, the other thought I had, uh, so some of my work involves interviewing some of these lobbyists, is that they don't only use these cultural sponsorships just for social license practices, but they also use them for access for their lobbyists because, as you were pointing out with the Russian example, you know, a minister turns up 
to open the gallery, they can send along their chief uh, lobbyist to go and hang out with that minister. So that seems to be how these different strategies complement each other, I think is also something to explore. Question behind you, the woman at the end of the row. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is uh, Paola Janguas and I'm a PhD student in the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. And I'm also looking at this sort of issues, but what can we learn from all this um, research that's been done on, on private companies sort of uh, advertising? So when the government is the owner of fossil fuels, when the government is the owner, and I think the discourses there are a little bit different. And again, this is also work I'm working on. <laughs> And the transition um when the transition narrative is we need those fossil fuel rents to pay for the transition so we also transition at some point but and it's a very different enemy if it's the government so what can we learn from from the strategies um that you've researched when the fossil fuel company is the government okay, thank you so much this is quick set of reactions and then we'll take some more questions so uh chris one of the questions was for you i think um yes is the the short answer i mean there are other pieces of research that we've done around and that that kind of more hidden dimension of the the kind of corporate receptions that kind of thing but I, the one that always stood out to me is we did a piece of uh investigation around an event at the british museum which was around the mexican festival with day of the dead and that event was not in the events calendar, and it sudden, really suddenly appeared over a matter of a few weeks, and it was very heavily BP branded. And afterwards, through sort of freedom of information requests, it turned out that while there was all this cultural activity downstairs that had been laid on, BP were upstairs in the restaurant with members of the Mexican government, and this was just a couple of months before new drilling licenses were being auctioned. So in that case, we were able to kind of track this kind of direct link between the the British Museum essentially being complicit in the, the advancing of that, that kind of fossil fuel production. Um, yeah. This is a question for you, I think. Um, the two questions that were directed at me were um, was about the distinction between brand versus issue-based advertising. Um, I have not really worked about this. Like in practice, the, I think from a consumer law perspective, um, because you want to prove ideally that a statement is factually incorrect that issue might be more easy if it's like a specific product based or so advertising but now in the past in the past years i think we managed there are some cases where also like the legal like the brand like brand type advertising could also be seen as factually incorrect so it's possible but that's like my specific legal take on it. it's probably not very helpful the issue that uh, you mentioned this is like a a big issue what about state like states certifying uh the carbon neutrality claims like that's the specific part i take from what you said um that's a big challenge uh, in the e i can say like th this kind of certification appears currently only in private certification so vera or these like uh, these uh, certification companies being taken as like a sign this is like like objective neutralization um, or labels like carbon neutral labels. So we have like a case. We had like a case in the Netherlands, where like this label, where the authority was in in essence deferring to this label, to this carbon neutral label, or saying, well, we're not going to check this. And uh, the risk we don't have that yet in Europe is the uh, like yeah is that certi is that is legal certification of offsets. So the EU has uh, now issued this uh, carbon cycles uh, communication. And uh, then there's also like all kinds of private standardization attempts of the offset market. Um, on the, I think, so my take on this is from a purely legal perspective in argumentation is to say that whatever the state is certifying can be, like they can certify, but consumer law or like other areas of law, such as disclosure rules, corporate disclosure rules, they have a different standard of, um, of strictness of like how how true must your statement be right and you could argue that whatever the state is like lazily certifying for their purposes of like carbon accounting or so it's not the same as what consumer law requires consumer le law requires actual factually true statements which yeah so that would be my attempt and otherwise i think that um 
the risk like for corporations on relying on carbon offsets needs to be communicated and that needs to be worked out. So we worked out now what the risks on the consumer law are. And I think now uh, needs to be worked out what are the risks for corporations under disclosure rules, so corporate and financial disclosure rules. Um, and then maybe, yeah, I don't know, fraud, like these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Man, yeah. Okay, that's, that's my thought. So just before we get another round of questions, Carl wants to come in on the question about the state and state greenwashing. Yeah, um, I, I think your point is a good one on how these pieces fit together uh, because the industry operates the same everywhere they go, right? So whether it's a, like government owned or not, they're, they're doing the same thing. So it, for example, our colleague from the fossil fuel treaty did a case study on uh, Malaysia and Petronas, the state old owned oil company, and they do all of the things that Chris mentioned in terms of pushing themselves into cultural organizations. Um, similarly in Canada, even though it's not public, Canada subsidizes fossil fuels at the highest level of any G20 country. So you could sort of say it's uh, state owned and the same argument is made. It's not just that we want, we need the industry for jobs and economic development, but they're paying for our sports teams, our community centers, et cetera, right? And their advertising is embedded in all of that. So I guess to me, um, it's about starting to take apart those arguments that it's like we need this for all of these reasons and uh, elevating the alternative. So, for example, one thing that works really well in Canada is to push back on how important oil and gas is for the economy and say there are more people who work in the beer industry because, like, Canadians are all about beer, right? So, <laughs> so that kind of thing um, can work. Uh, pointing out the level of inv government investment going into harming and killing people and what could be avoided. I would not recommend using the word subsidies because we actually do need to put public money into getting the uh, alternatives scaled, but using language like we're pouring our money down the drain, you know, our money, taxpayer money, taxpayer dollars down the drain when it could, could be going into what we're trying to, to create. Um, that will save those lives and, and save those communities. Great, excellent point. Uh, yeah, Richard, last door. Uh, thank you. Uh, Richard Dennis from the Australia Institute. Uh, thank you. They were wonderful presentations. I think my question's mainly for Chris, but uh, in Australia, our National War Memorial's beautiful building as you'd expect it to be, and we have the eternal flame that burns so we never forget the soldiers that gave their life for Australia. And it is, of course, sponsored by the Gas Association in the War Memorial. Um, so I guess my question to you, but to all of you is like, what? It, how do you see the benefits of taking on these campaigns as a way to force the fossil fuel industry to, uh, to resist? Because I don't think Australians, I don't know about other countries, I don't think people quite realise how pernicious this advertising is. And calling for it to be banned, calling for it to be removed, forces them to demand the right to keep doing it, which I think is a win. And I guess my specific question, apart from the strategy, is in Australia there's no publicly available info on how much the sponsorships cost. But from what I've been able to find, it's trivial. You know, like an institution might cost $100 million a year to run and for $100,000 they get naming rights. So, you know, we're, we kind of push for more information on this. Is, is that information available in other countries? Because I, I fear they're getting a lot, of, a lot of PR for actually very small amounts of money. Okay, good points. Any other questions in this round? Yes, one at the back there and then the lady here in purple. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, Clemens appreciated your reference to the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, also looking at some research that came out during that process, um, there was a, a study about the role of the um, spy firm Mangavan, Bisco and Duchin, which formed in response to the Nestle campaign in the 70s where the strategy they advised was um, to isolate the radicals, cultivate the idealists, um, and then you could co-opt the realists, and therefore the opportunists would come along with you. So 
um, I guess looking at the idealists as kind of a key sector here, which are those who would, um, who aren't as extreme in their methods, but support the goals. I wonder, I mean, Carol already talked a little bit to this in terms of the positive values, but just how do we keep the idealists on side with these, with our tactics? Thank you. Another great question. There's just one other question at the back there in this round, and then we'll get some more responses from the panel. Hi, I'm Ben Ayliff from the Energy Transition Fund. Um, I was just curious if you'd seen any um, sort of shift in the tactics or the strategy that oil and gas companies are using to um, advertise, to connect themselves with well-loved institutions in light of what's happened uh, in Ukraine. And so whether with the sort of the competing narratives that we see now around energy security, national security, um, price, cost of living, but then also, you know, the appallingly high um, profits that these companies are making calls for windfall taxes and things like that. I just wonder if, you, if, the, if you've been able to see any shifts in the kind of strategies that yet they're using to navigate and to thrive in this kind of space too. Great, thank you. Joachim, do you want to start? Because you didn't get a say last time around. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it, it also, uh, I mean, questions reflect the focus on, on oil and gas. Uh, and I, and I, I think I should just briefly on, on comment on this, I guess, because that's not that surprising because it is like there is pretty much or more or less that consensus, at least if you look to take, uh, to uh, say, for example, the IAA projections as some sort of consensus on a, like in terms of continued upscaling of chemical production. So it's, you know, it's it, even though that petrochemicals and fossil fuels are intrinsically linked and that, I mean, Total, Shell, um, ExxonMobil are amongst the biggest chemical producers in the world. Um, they are not questioned on that part of their, uh, on that uh, part of their activities, although it's, you know, uh, potentially large, well, large and increasing share, you could argue, in, 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 uh, given the prospects of potentially or at some point eventually declining um, oil and gas extraction. So, so I think it's just, I guess, a plea to, to consider, I think that in, uh, in relation to understanding some of these, these companies that, that a lot, a large part of their business is, is chemicals and that that's not necessarily, it's not a given that plastics uh, production should, uh, should, should increase and that it's seen that the, you know, there, there is a notion that there is a, a future for for oil and chemicals, and that you know, in in questioning, say what alternative uses, there there is also scope or room for for questioning, the uh, the proliferation of of uh, yeah chemicals production. Okay, thanks, Cara. You wanted to come in. Yeah, on sort of what's changing um, and what's not. I've worked uh, on supply side communications for about fifteen years, so tracking this. And, and just hearing the other presentations, I'm just struck by an even greater level, the degree to which their messages are very consistent, even the petrochemical and the oil and gas folks, and how insidious that is. Um, and, and so unfortunately, I would have to say I've seen a lot of the same arguments being made over that time span. Things like putting the blame on individuals um, is a classic. Shell's been doing that forever, you know, or have you bought your programmable thermostat, right? It's just, it, they do that all the time and that's really intentional to keep their role out of it and not look at the systemic. But I do think there are a few things changing that are, are really challenging. One is that they were flat out climate deniers and now they're not. Now they're like, we're on this path, right, as we've seen. And I think that is incredibly dangerous. Um, and they've also done a better job of mapping out what those pathways are, of actually saying, what does this look like? And we haven't done that, our governments haven't done that. And, and so that was my point about, we have to make that pathway really clear because we're keeping up with them and now having to debunk carbon capture and storage, blue hydrogen arguments. And it's much harder to reframe an argument than set the frame in the first place. Chris or Clemens, either of you wanna come in? don't have to we can collect more questions but um uh so when one of the things i said so that that question about the amount of money is a really interesting one because try try as we might um it's very very difficult to get hold of that information even even through freedom of information during the uk 
but the powerful thing about it, uh, so an organization platform who uh, used to work on this issue actually took Tate Galleries to Information Tribunal to force not the current amount of the sponsorship at that time, but the past amount even to be publicly disclosed. And the strength of that as a kind of campaigning strategy is it just exposed the kind of closeness of the, uh, of Tate with uh, BP at that time. The, the chair of their trustees was John Brown, who was the former CEO of BP as well. So there was a nice kind of separation there as well. But, it, but these kind of forums, and I think we've sort of seen this in the kind of climate litigation piece and the use of law, is actually um, creating these arenas or these forums for that, that information to be exposed um, and, and the kind of, you know, exposing the lie of philanthropy, which underlies this. Uh, there was a, a piece of research that I was kind of point back to about how charities use celebrities in order to promote their campaigns and causes and people ordinarily think oh that's how we're going to extend our reach and our social media and more petition signups and so on but actually there was research to suggest that the use of celebrities is to persuade and frame yourself to governments and policy makers that you're in touch with the public mood and i think sometimes there's that aspect going on with the cultural and the sports sponsorship is yeah it's a it's about kind of communicating those things and i i think in terms of the the sort of shifts as there's a move kind of slightly away from cultural institutions at least at least more towards uh you know instagram influences and, and those kinds of spaces a little bit more as well um and just on ben's question around the the question of uh, ukraine and, and so on i think kind of fortunate well fortunately isn't the right word but in terms of bp sort of have managed to sidestep that question somewhat because of the offloading of Rosneft. But what's what's interesting, at least for the campaign we're about to do, is the next British Museum exhibition sponsored by BP is on Egypt. And so that's emerging right before COP27. But, you know, there's another really important human rights context that we want to be highlighting that the BP kind of managed to wriggle out of um, in terms of us shining a spotlight on their, their kind of relationships around Russia as well. So, um, you know, that, that kind of kind of aspect of sidestepping, but the cultural institution, again, is providing that, that kind of deflection. So. I just maybe wanted to pick on a little bit on the issue of what are the benefits of taking on advertising. Um, I think that the, what's interesting about advertising from a legal perspective is that it opens up like an additional legal role, like a legal route to let's say, um, address various issues like uh, mitigation strategies, the role of the fossil industry, um, techno fixes, offsetting. So these issues uh, like within the legal framework and often also like uh, with a lower threshold in regard of standing, so of getting into courts because you just, that's the one thing. And the other thing is more in terms of communication. I feel that um, through like everybody knows something about advertising which makes it like easier for people to relate to like more abstract issues like offsetting or or mitigation or or so on so you can talk about like can trees really like do something about uh co2 and like making it like really concrete in that way so yeah thank we you you've probably got time for one or two uh is that you do Thank you so much. What a fantastic uh, panel. Uh, Zipporah Roman Stand Dot Earth and Fossil Fuel Treaty. I, um, I've been thinking a lot about how the industry has been not only um, uh, having these consistent narratives, as you've pointed out, uh, Kara and others, um, but also simultaneously designing strategies around how to get uh, the vehicles for getting that those messages out. Um, which is why I, I love the culture unstained work, but it, it but so but also through harnessing populist anger and and fueling populist divisions around fear and 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 security. I'm thinking about the tremendous work of the academic uh, Timothy Wood, who who's written quite a lot of papers on the kind of creation of a petro public. And, and, and the work of, and the insidious work of the oil industry in what we're seeing now, especially in the US and Canada, and I think also uh, Australia. And, and so I have two questions really for you. And one is, how do we take back this frame on security and planning? Because in the, in the climate era, given you know 33 million displaced in Pakistan alone, et cetera, it feels like 
the the narrative around security should be ours, and it is so not right now. And and secondly, what are your thoughts on the vehicles for how we get these narratives out? Because what I'm really concerned about is when you see the social media analysis by, well, you know, there's a number of different uh, academics who are doing it, where you kind of add up the the astroturf groups that are being created, the 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 kind of social media campaigns that fuel populist anger and and create this petro public. I don't see us doing that. In, in, in the movement or those who work on climate change. And I find that terrifying. And, and we seem to be constantly maybe getting better at some of the narratives and echo chambers we're trying to create, but then sending it back out through the same voices. You know, and it, it, it doesn't speak at all to any of that tremendous research, like Jane McAlevey, No Shortcuts, or even Jonathan Haidt's work, The Righteous Mind, where the, it's not about necessarily the message, right? It's about the tribes. It's about who you're, who you're hearing from, how you're a part of something bigger. And I feel like we need new thinking on how we're getting these narratives out and what we're creating, because right now, um, I'm terrified of what we're seeing in the kind of the, the, the polarization and populism that is being fueled uh, by the oil and gas industry. Okay, so let's not end on a note of terror. We need to end on a note of hope. We've got four <laughs> minutes left and we've got four panelists. I'm going to give you one minute each to, or maybe we could squeeze in one more question, but let's, let's go for one minute each on what gives you hope in terms of this terrain. Like where are, where are we making progress headway? Should it be about engaging with, sec with uh, security questions? What are the what gives you the most hope in terms of trying to shift the debate or reframe supply side discussions? Uh, let's go back down this way, Cara. You start. Maybe this is a weird thing to start with when you say what gives you hope, but I do think it is important that we're at this level where people have real fear around extreme weather, um, and that's unfortunately a lived thing now, right? We've gotten to the point where the frog is in the boiling pot. Um, and so I do think we need to reclaim that the pathway to security is getting off of what's causing the problem in the first place and just own it. Um, and then I, I agree with you completely, Zippor, around like we have to get more creative with our channels. And I guess what gives me hope is that I feel at least on the advocacy side, we're starting to have different conversations that it can't just be like government relations work or being really wonky in how we're talking that we actually need to start to be more proactive and, and create some of those um, normative campaigns ourselves. And I think we have evidence from other movements like Freedom to Marry on how to do normative campaigns. And we really start to need to start bringing that in versus always sounding very technical, very wonky, and quite um, divisive. Okay, thanks, Claire. I, I don't have a really sophisticated view on, uh, on on hope or so on the issue. I can only say in what I do, which is uh, grabbing legal stuff and throwing it at fossil companies, is um, some of them work. And the uh, things that I've been trying out, which is in the consumer law area, is something that uh, is easily rec replicable by other like regular folks out there, which they also do. So we had like this. This one a successful complaint against Shell, and this one, like this one, was was then mirrored by like other people who like picked it up and also challenged uh, CO two neutral bananas, for example. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Okay, you okay? Yeah, I, I can add in terms of the I guess which is my role at the plastics or chemicals view that you know that that artwork that I showed you right that that was like pretty pretty strong pretty strong picture in you know in Nairobi in at at the uh, UNEA and it you know it's part of a movement towards uh, working for uh, addressing say the supply the production of plastics on a global scale like caps to global uh, plastic production have been made and there's you know the that type of imaging imagery is really really powerful and uh, you know the the artist is also an activist no surprise and i i think that say just seeing the work going into trying to stop and address that at, and naturalize the idea that that plastics production will double in the next 20 years <laughs> uh, versus that putting, you know, it's, uh, stopping the tap or turning off the tap. I think that that movement has has a lot of momentum. And, and I think I know that it wasn't like imaginable a couple, just a couple of years ago that there would actually be at that high level 
a potential for a global uh, treaty addressing say the scale of production so yeah. so in that sense that's actually really really hopeful but that also means that it's so really 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 important that the linkages between fossil fuels and plastics are made visible in relation to the uh, ongoing uh, treaty negotiations thanks so much chris final word um i think some of the kind of creative tactics and the creative activism i pointed to not just to say this is great but actually maybe to look at those tactics and think what worked about some of them or what didn't work about some of them and when i've done like workshops with people in the past who don't think of themselves as activists learning a song or a performance is a good way of getting them to go across that line and, and transgress but but also in terms of the kind of disruption it can have in the fossil fuel industry's narrative that said just thinking about the social media space and on a personal level i think uh the young women of color like michaela loach and vanessa Mukate, they're breaking down the kind of complexity of net zero and new drilling and so on and i th it's not a specific thing but i think whatever support and resource we can bring to those kind of voices because i, I think like you were saying about the, the kind of tribes and how the messages are flowing i think that's where we maybe need to put a lot of focus and energy because that's where people it feels more relatable it feels more personal and there's that different kind of connection and networks that are happening in those spaces um but yeah michaela loach is amazing great well thanks so, so much everyone we're out of time so thanks to all of you for coming along uh, for a fantastic discussion thanks to our panelists the conversation can carry on now over coffee uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference thanks,